Okay, the web service is now deployed and running. The next step is to compile the client program that talks to it. I showed you the client program earlier. All it does is accept numbers as arguments from the command line, and it passes each one to the remote web service and prints the string that it produces. Now, to do this, it's first necessary to write one more XML file. This is the client config file. The configuration tag contains just one other tag, the WSDL tag. The location setting is the full URL of the service. You may recognize this as a portion of the endpoint URL that was input into the deploy tool earlier. And here is the endpoint address alias. This is the name of the package of the service classes. Now, we're going to be generating some class files to be used as the local stub, and they need to have a directory. So the next thing we're going to do is create a directory named stubs. To generate the code, the WS compile program is used again, but this time with a different set of options. The class path needs to be set, too. Here is a two-line script that does that. The class path is set to the current directory, the standard J2EE jar file, and another jar file named JAXRPC impl for implement. The option used on the WS compile command line is gen colon client. This is used to generate the client code. Now, this doesn't generate the client class. This only generates the stub classes that will be used by the client. The D option is used to specify the directory that will hold the output from this program. And the input file is the XML file that we've just written. Inside the stubs directory now is a subdirectory. And inside that subdirectory is the set of class files that were created by WS Compile. Notice that the subdirectory name is the same as the package name of the client, and there are several class files in this subdirectory. Exactly which class files are created depends on the type and number of arguments passed to the service methods and the types of returns that come back. Now this class file, the next to the last one here in the list, is the one that holds the stub method that will be called by the client. Here, let me show you the client code again. Now, notice this second import statement. The class that was just created is addressed by this import statement, so its methods can be called from this program. Now, this method call is a reference to the stub that contains the methods of the actual service. The stub is returned and then it's cast to the interface. And if you remember, this is the interface that defines the service method that we want to call. And that's all that's left to do now is to call the service method in this loop, which is done with each of the numbers on the command line. I should point out that we are at the demarcation between the development of a bean and the development of the application. Somebody could be off somewhere developing beans and writing documentation on how to use them, and somebody else could be here writing the application code that uses them. If this is being done by one person, this is the point at which that one person changes hats. The final step of preparation is to compile the client. And once again, I have a simple script that does that. Now, the class path is set just the same as it was before, with the current directory and two of the standard jar files, but it also has this new stubs directory in it. In that directory, starting over, that directory is where it will find the web services package and all the new classes that it contains. The Java compiler then compiles the program. 
To run the program, you will need to specify quite a few jar files. And here they are. I wrote this script to build up the class path in pieces so it would be easier to read this file. The script sets the class path to include all of these jar files, then in its last line it uses the JVM, the Java command, to run the program. And here's what happens. There. Now, this script is a bit talky because of the way the class path is set over and over again, but you can see the web service ran just fine. Each of the numbers on the command line is printed, and the names of the digits are printed right after it. Now, this may seem like a lot of work to perform a simple function, and you're right. The two main areas of confusion are figuring out the names that go into the slots of the deploy tool and figuring out the information that goes into those XML files. The Java part's easy. One thing to watch for is the fact that you can have a minor typo in one of the names somewhere in XML or in the deploy tool, and it will not be reported to you because there is no cross-referencing of things the way it is in Java. If your web service doesn't run, then all you can do is resort to the log files and hope there's a clue somewhere in there.